Welcome. I'm Liz Beaumont. I'm Associate Professor of Politics and Legal Studies at UC Santa Cruz, and I'll be your moderator today. I'm here with a panel of really terrific, inspiring people. We have Vesna Terselic, Jamila Rakib, and Francis Morlapay, whom I will be introducing momentarily. This is the fourth event in a series called Inspiring Change in Times of Crisis, Conversations That Matter with Right Livelihood Award Laureates. It's co-hosted by the Right Livelihood Foundation and by UC Santa Cruz. Uh, many thanks to the friends of the Right Livelihood Foundation and Right Livelihood College, especially David Shaw, who's the coordinator of the Right Livelihood College here at UC Santa Cruz, and Stina Th Thanner from the Light Right Livelihood Foundation. If you have questions for any of our panelists at any time, please email them to rlc-webinar at ucsc.edu. That's rlc-webinar at ucsc.edu. And please visit oh, uh, the rightlivelihood.ucsc.edu or rightlivelihoodawards.org to sign up for our mailing list, receive information about future events. Uh, we encourage you to subscribe to our channels on YouTube and be mo no mo notified as we post videos from the series. The next event is going to be May 27th on the topic of inequality and vulnerability in crisis. So with that, let's have a few introductions. We're so fortunate to have three incredible Right Livelihood Foundation laureates and friends here with us to discuss, to discuss our theme, which is threats and opportunities for democracy during the global challenges being presented by the coronavirus pandemic. We have uh, Vesna, who is largely responsible for uh, founding the Croatian anti-war campaign in 1991. And she was given the award together with Katarina Karhuna in 1998 for their dedication to a long-term process of peace building and reconciliation in the Balkans. Now, Vesna is director of Documenta, which is a center that uh, wants to break the silence about and falsification of war crimes and other war-related events in the period from 1941 to 2000. We also have Jamila, who is uh, connected with uh, Laureate Jean Sharp. She is a specialist in the study and practice of strategic nonviolence. And she's the executive director of the late 2012 uh, Laureate Jean Sharp's Albert Einstein Institution, uh, which has the aim of advancing the worldwide study and strategic use of nonviolent um, action in conflict and is very well known. Um, she's worked uh, very closely or with Jean for many years, and she's now the director's fellow, uh, a director's fellow at the MIT Media Lab as well. Frankie was given the award in 1987 for revealing the political and economic causes of world hunger and how citizens can help to remedy them. She's the author or co-author of 19 books about world hunger, living democracy, and the environment. She co-founded the Institute for Food and Development Policy in 1975 and in 1990, the Center for Living Democracy. In 2001, uh, Morlepe founded the Small Planet Institute, which has the mission of helping to define, articulate, and further an historic tra transition, a worldwide shift from the dominant failing notion of democracy as a set of fixed institutions toward democracy understood as a way of life. So just to frame our conversation for today, which we hope will be very conversational and really open a lot of opportunity for the laureates themselves to offer their reflections and engage with each other, we're thinking about the fact that across the globe, we see that coronavirus is not only posing a threat to our medical health, but it's really posing a number of threats to the health of our political and civil society institutions um, worldwide. There's a lot of fear right now about anti-democratic trends and rising conflict. On the one hand, part of what we're seeing in this moment are very problematic responses by many governments. Um, many states are trying to implement new rules and regulations very quickly that they're not, um, they're not able to follow regular democratic protocols. 
In some cases, such as we've seen in Hungary, political leaders are using the pandemic to consolidate their own power uh, and their own control, which contributes to a trend of authoritarianism that was already underway. In some countries, we've seen that the pandemic is fueling problematic trends of xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment um, and policies. In many regions, including China and Egypt and Singapore and the US, we're seeing a kind of censorship pandemic in which governments are trying to suppress or punish journalists or critics or activists or whistleblowers who've been trying to raise various concerns. We're also seeing issues of transparency and misinformation or suppression of accurate data and scientific information. We're seeing in a number of countries, including the US, that there's been competition to gain access to the limited supplies and a lot of attempts to outbid. In some areas, we're seeing that the capacities for groups to meet and movements to organize has been very greatly curtailed. Uh, uh, and there are also many questions about whether and how elections are going to be able to proceed in many places. And then of course, we have the fact that across the globe, the pandemic has been revealing the extent of many inequalities within and across our societies. We're seeing uh, the extent of health disparities and access to health care. We're seeing labor precarity um, and job insecurity. We're seeing food insecurity, housing insecurity, and just in, in general, a lot of levels of economic precarity and, ins and insufficient social safety nets. And we're uh, having revealed the extent to which many of our governments have not been able to adequately respond to the basic human needs of their populations in this time. Now, these are some of the threats uh, that I think our, our panelists today may be speaking to, to some extent and in, in different kinds of ways. On the other hand, as important as it is to recognize and grapple with these kinds of threats to democracy, we're also able to think about the fact that maybe there are new opportunities, new possibilities that we could see for the future of democratic societies in this moment. Creating new demands, new political demands, shaking up our institutions might actually be a good thing, a good opportunity. So much of what had been happening with our institutions had been broken um, or had been uh, undemocratic in many ways already. And this isn't just a time to think about our institutions, but also how people could be contributing to new movements and, and by engaging in participatory democracy around issues that are becoming more visible, from healthcare to food supply, global connectedness, interdependence, uh, new possibilities to think about reducing fossil fuel consumption as we reduce our car and plane travel. Um, there's a lot that seems possible now. And it's an important moment not just to be reflecting on the threats that we're seeing, but also how we might try to respond to them. And to be asking, what are the aspects of current democratic institutions and practices that actually really need to be protected and why? Um, but also what needs to be rethought, what might be transformed or reconsidered in this moment? Are there new democratic possibilities that we can be identifying and working on as the crisis makes us think some of the ways we've been doing things, some of the ways that we've been prioritizing or failing to prioritize certain values or goals or aspirations, such as access to health? And does this moment of crisis open the opportunity to envision and work towards different types of governance? Um, and if so, what types of discussions, actions, movements might this involve? What could we draw on? What could we build? In other words, instead of just thinking that what we need in this moment is to have all hands on deck to save and protect a largely broken or problematic system as it is, maybe this is a time to think more deeply with an eye toward the future that we want to see and not just the past. So I'm hoping that our conversation today will be about the moment of now that we're seeing in the present and learning from the present, but that it is also going to involve thinking about the question, what have we learned from the past and your experiences and what might we want to be building toward the future and how to do so. So uh, with that, I'd like us to um, just have a chance for each of you to give uh, your own reflections, your own statements about how you're relating to these themes of the discussion, the moment of now, the threats to democracy uh, that we see now, but also what could we be building toward the future? What opportunities do we see? Not waiting for the future to get started, but starting now and strike while the, uh, while the hammer and, and iron is hot. Um, so then we'll have time for more of a focus on the conversation after the remarks. Uh, with that, um, I would like to go ahead and, and ask you, Vesna, to give your 
thoughts and your share your reflections and what you're seeing either in Croatia or or, um, or glo more globally as you think about this theme of threats and opportunities for democracy. What do you think? Uh, thank you for all these uh, important questions. Uh, I would speak about threats and opportunities at the same time because uh, basically they come in a package. So it's that seeing the leaders uh, in some countries uh, trying to take additional control over societies and strengthening their grip. You mentioned Hungary. I would maybe add uh, our neighboring Serbia, where they eventually introduced a very strict police hour and have not allowed people to, to go out uh, for days uh, and uh, old people actually not been allowed to walk out for more than one month. And then when eventually there have been fortunately results and uh, they have again been able to walk out in their uh, communities, uh, then government actually introduced uh, kind of Corona parties. Uh, and in Croatia, uh, which is in the moment uh, preceding country of uh, Council of European uh, Union, uh, government tried to declare that uh, they will take decisions, that parliament is, parliament is not needed, but then out of reactions of public, uh, of society, this was simply silently abandoned. Uh, and when we look at, at the global level, how we are functioning as, uh, as societies and countries, in the same moment, we see uh, amazing effort of health workers. We see amazing effort of uh, neighbors helping to each other, of uh, different uh, parts of societies engaging in solidarity efforts. But on the other side, we eventually see where our World Health Organization and United Nations stand and how fractured their responses, how serious are threats in the middle of crisis uh, related to financing of World Health Organization in the moment when, of course, each institution can be criticized. And I believe that critical examination and evaluation is very essential. But it's that uh, I am quite clear that this is not the best moment to withdraw a support uh, to the organization, which is the only barrier which we have in a time when in some countries you maybe have two beds in an intense care. And it's absolutely uh, clear that to uh, eventually see the end of Corona pandemic, we will need uh, to uh, eventually diminish a number of positive cases in all the countries so that we need each other. We uh, are now closed in our borders. Uh, in European Union, you cannot really pass a state border without a special reason, uh, which is really feeding uh, the emotions related to exclusion, uh, fear, and excluding uh, especially migrants. So it's that uh, the vulnerable groups, instead of receiving additional support, are sometimes under attack. And uh, migrants are, you know, living in probably the most difficult conditions in uh, spaces which are very crowded. So it's, it's a high risk situation. And it's that uh, then uh, governments take all the decisions. Just uh, yesterday, investigative journalists found out in Croatia that government dipped in a fund which is devoted to uh, our disabled neighbors. Uh, to uh, eventually secure uh, their accessibility of jobs. And they have transferred this money in the economic crisis to some other purposes to secure uh, sufficient money in the economic crisis. It is completely unacceptable to take from the most vulnerable groups to uh, try to, you know, to put something uh, in a funds for the current crisis. So it's that budgets needs to be, of course, reviewed, but in a reasonable manner. And uh, the most vulnerable groups are actually the last to be targeted. So this is, of course, not connected just to Croatia, but to many other countries. So related to democracy, 
there is opportunity. There is opportunity to secure better access to, uh, to health, to come closer to universal health care, to come closer to equal distribution uh, of uh, access to food, to uh, all the goods. There is a possibility of making sure that we treat this crisis as a possibility to learn something for climate crisis, for climate changes catastrophe, which we are facing. Will we be able to, to do that? Uh, there is a clear pressure on media, uh, on journalists and editors to not be overly critical about what governments currently do. And I understand the need to, uh, to speak through media in encouraging way to, to share a spirit of hope and uh, give additional inspiration to people to cope, to be in solidarity, to survive. Finally, to, uh, you know, to follow uh, the lead of United Nations uh, uh, Secretary General calling on ceasefire in all the wars and conflicts around the world. Uh, but uh, it's very much needed to eventually point a finger to uh, in uh, acceptable uh, uh, stepping over democratic controls. And for me, the question is, Okay, so we are not uh, seeing the most critical articles currently in the press, especially in the countries which are now seeing uh, the very large uh, number of deaths every day, like United Kingdom or still Italy and Spain and France, uh, United States, you know, the countries which are really uh, in the peak of struggling. But I'm afraid that virus will hit much more serious also in Ecuador, Mexico, in Africa, uh, where the number of uh, beds in the intense care facilities is much lower. So it will be much more difficult to help. So it's that uh, it's very important also to look towards the moment when uh, the number of deaths will go down and it will be very uh, essential to look critically to, to what was done, what was lacking, even in rich countries as European Union countries. Uh, the, the basic things, accessibility of masks, of protection equipment, protection equipment for health workers was a very serious issue, not to mention how it looks in some of the African countries. So it's uh, that uh, there will be need to examine critically and I think uh, there is much to be learned from difficulties which we have with dealing with the past, uh, as uh, I'm daily working on issues of dealing with the uh, legacy of uh, past of 20th century, of the wars in 20th century in my countries that was First World War, Second World War with le legacy of uh, Holocaust and genocide against Jews genocide against Serbs and Roma in Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina and other post yugoslav countries. But also legacies of wars of 90s where genocide in Srebrenica is still not being acknowledged in all post yugoslav countries. So it's that we're dealing globally with difficulties in dealing with legacy of colonization and slavery and inequalities which are linked with uh, access to democratic institutions related to the legacy of past. So it is that uh, I would say that the capacity to critically examine what our governments and what civil society organizations, what hospitals did right and wrong in this crisis will be somehow interrelated with our capacity to deal with our past. If we are able to deal critically with legacy of violent past, maybe we will be able to deal critically with legacy of uh, this crisis and learn from it because we are as a humankind very far from universal health care and it should be for me self-understanding that health care should be accessible why it's not why uh, the world is so rich why some in the world are so rich and not everyone can actually have access healthcare. These are simple questions to be addressed uh, and to be asked after crisis uh, goes slow down and uh, finally, hopefully, 
with uh, some medicines uh, eventually leaves us. Great, thank you, Vesna. That's so much rich food for thought. I think you're absolutely right that this is a time to really be reflecting on, on so much of, of what's happened um, before and then how we want to move forward and, and what, um, what is possible to rethink a lot of the ways that we've been <clears throat> treating the poor and the vulnerable within countries um, and how we've been responding to our own our own pasts and the institutions that we've we've developed. I want to remind everyone that if you'd like to um, uh, propose any questions or uh, add any comments uh, for a conversation, um, you can send them via email to rlc-webinar at ucse.edu. Um, and with that, I'd love to um, get Jamila um, into our conversation and hear um, your thoughts on all of this. You might must have a, a, a lot of um, reflections on the current moment and, and its meaning in terms of threats and opportunities for democracy, Jamila. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and, and thank you all. Um, it's great to be with you and to be part of this conversation, especially at a moment of such great significance. Um, and also, I think for, for all of us, a moment of uncertainty and uh, a lot of anxiety. Um, for activists and organizers who've been struggling against powerful opponents and who are often facing huge difficulties, uh, obviously this crisis has produced a lot of new challenges. Uh, part of what makes this crisis so disruptive is that people all over the world are uh, caught up in the daily battle of finding food, finding masks, you know, uh, trying to stay healthy, being worried about the health of their loved ones. Um, and for some groups, it's this struggle, right, and this sort of general anxiety and uncertainty that has understandably, at least for uh, the time being, sort of overshadowed some of the ongoing struggles in which uh, they've been involved. So uh, we've talked a bit about how some governments are also exploiting this crisis uh, to advance their agendas and to, you know, sort of consolidate their hold on power. And that's nothing new. Um, there's a long history to governments that take advantage of crises to uh, suspend government institutions, especially ones that really serve as a check on their power. Um, they spread misinformation to distract people and to control the narrative. Uh, they use minorities and immigrants to scapegoat. And uh, more generally, they, they, they promote a general sense of fear and helplessness uh, among people. So we're seeing a lot of this and, and just a couple of examples. Uh, we've heard about how in Hungary, uh, you know, Viktor Orban has put in place measures that basically allow him to rule by decree indefinitely. Um, in Cambodia, we're seeing a number of new emergency laws um, that grant the country's ruler massive new powers, including the right to carry out sort of unlimited surveillance and to control uh, the press and social media. The Israeli government has exploited the pandemic uh, to undermine democratic principles, uh, to stop the courts from convening, which uh, have indefinitely postponed the corruption hearing against Benjamin Netanyahu. So a lot of these laws and measures are being presented as temporary, like a lot of the new surveillance uh, kind of measures that are being put in place. Uh, people are understandably sort of desperate for any tools and measures that could stop the spread of the virus and uh, to sort of mitigate its human and its economic cost. Um, and so I think what we're seeing globally is sort of an increased openness to the use of surveillance technology, all in the name of fighting the virus. I'm talking about some of the new contact tracing apps. Um, and even though governments and companies are claiming that these tools are gonna be sort of done away with once the crisis is over, uh, we should approach that with some sense of caution and skepticism. I've heard a lot of people in recent days repeating this old Soviet saying that there's nothing so permanent as a temporary measure. Um, I think we need to be careful of this sort of narrative that we've seen emerging uh, among some circles in recent weeks and months, and that's the idea that authoritarianism is, is bad, sure, but that it's actually good for fighting the virus um, because it allows a sort of centralized approach. Um, and I think there's, there's so much to say about that in, in terms of comparing the various countries and their responses to uh, this public health crisis. But I'd like to sort of look at Hong Kong as an example, as a sort of case study. We've seen that they've had a huge success 
and both blocking the initial wave of the pandemic and also new infections. Um, and this isn't because of the centralized approach of a leader, but because of its people. Um, and it's specifically the networks and the systems for organizing and mobilizing and decision making that were created and strengthened to, uh, you know, during the 2019 uh, uprising. So just as an example, Hong Kongers defied a government ban on masks, uh, and they pretty much universally adopted mask wearing, even when their executive leader uh, wore one and then sometimes didn't wear one. She also wore one incorrectly at one point, which was an opportunity for them to sort of mock her and to bring attention to that. Uh, they also set up uh, these so-called mask brigades. Um, which were responsible for acquiring and distributing masks, especially to the poor and elderly. Uh, an army of volunteers uh, that were also sort of created during the uprising um, also, you know, worked in heavily populated buildings and in populations that to, to install hand sanitizer dispensers. The digital maps that were used normally to track police and to track protests uh, were now used to track outbreaks and the availability of, of, of hand sanitizer and distribution. And, and, and other PPE. Um, so there's a lot that groups are doing to, to adapt. And in spite of the, some of the new restrictions we're seeing on physical distancing, uh, they are adapting. Um, so it's not just the restrictions, I think, on physical distancing, but also uh, concerns for people's health, right? That's meant that there's been almost, at least initially, a complete halt to street protests and demonstrations, especially in the sort of early days and weeks uh, after the outbreak. Uh, but that doesn't mean that movements aren't active, right? So as we saw in Hong Kong, but also all over the world, um, just because we're not seeing people in the streets necessarily, uh, and the media isn't able to capture this sort of activity, doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, even without these current restrictions, it's important to remember that street demonstrations are only one uh, type of action, right? In a whole sort of repertoire of methods available to people. They're the sort of public and symbolic manifestations of what's often happening behind the scenes and sort of all the activities that groups are engaged in. Uh, my colleague and mentor, Jean Sharp, cataloged 198 of these methods. These are all the methods that range from the symbolic methods of social uh, of, of protests and also acts of social and political and economic non-cooperation, as well as the creation of alternative institutions, which we're also seeing a lot of now. Um, and just as a sort of side note, there's a really cool document that I found years ago online that's called 198 Methods 2.0. And these are the sort of digital adaptation of the methods that have been historically used. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we're going to try to share the, a, a link to that document. So that document preceded this current crisis. And I think what it shows is that activists are already really savvy with the tech tools, right? In part because they recognize how these tools really reduce the cost of organizing and mobilizing. Um, and also because restrictions on physical gatherings and uh, on criminalization of protests, that's unfortunately nothing new for a whole number of countries. So activists have been sort of circumventing uh, a lot of those restrictions and uh, curtailment of their freedom for, for many years. And there's a lot we can learn from that. So, um, the good news is, uh, you know, movements are, you know, obviously they're experiencing a time of great challenge, uh, but that's, that's not the good news. The good news is that they're, they're unfortunately not, not, no strangers to that, no strangers to uh, sort of acting in spite of challenges, to overcoming them, to adapting to difficult conditions, uh, because they've had to do that in order to level the playing field against very powerful opponents. Um, and crises of various kinds, as we know, are a feature of life. Um, so fear is nothing new. And, and, and the goal isn't to deny that fear uh, or even to eliminate it, but really to act in spite of it. Uh, Gandhi talked a lot about this concept of casting off fear, right? Not eliminating it, but not allowing it to paralyze you. Um, and I think fortunately people around the world are doing that. There's lots and lots of examples of what people are doing in this moment to both sustain their movements and also to use this time as an opportunity for recruitment recruitment and growth to kind of take control of the narrative, to bring, uh, 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 to make more visible existing injustices that have preceded this pandemic, you know, uh, uh, what, what Vesna also referred to. Um, and I think uh, also really importantly, the acts of mutual aid and, and, and solidarity, right? People are 
coordinating and distributing resources to people in need. They're creating food banks. They're reclaiming vacant housing. They're making donations. They're you know, making masks at home. Um, and they're trying to figure out what are the needs of their community and without asking anything of their government, they're working to fill that need. So this goes beyond just simple charity, right? It's distinct from that because it's really framed in a sense of shared uh, uh, values, shared solidarity, and also a shared destiny. So there's a sort of revolutionary nature to it. And I think it's what Gandhi called constructive programs. And I think it's so important to kind of keep in mind what people are doing to kind of really build power in their communities, power that's really useful right now, but also that's going to be used as a basis of action uh, in the future once, you know, we you know, end this sort of initial phase of this pandemic. And we do have to re remind ourselves uh, that, that 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 day will come. So we can't overstate the extent to which, uh, you know, these, these strengthening of civil society is so important right now um, and, and how instrumental that is in, in sustaining movements. Because I think at the root of this is how do we sustain hope in this moment? You know, it feels very dark uh, for, for all of us. And so I think hope in this moment is, is everything. Um, and it's not a blind hope, you know, that where we believe the inevitability that everything's going to be okay, no matter what we do, but one that really empowers us and, and recognizes that what we do matters, uh, that the future depends on what we do or what we refuse to do, uh, that that future is ours to build, um, and that this moment of anxiety and vulnerability uh, can be used to bring attention to injustices to regroup, to learn, and to strategize, um, and to emerge with, with new strength um, in our communities. Uh, so in, in that way, I think it is, it is uh, there's, there's real grounds for hope in, in the midst of all, all of the darkness. Um, that's, that's all I have for the moment. Thank you. Wow, great, Jamila. That's uh, that's I, so valuable, so helpful to think about those um, both those examples, those those models of solidarity, and and of people coming together to um, to help their own communities and to think about others. Um, it looks like we've been able to share the document that Jamila mentioned on the Right Livelihood Twitter feed. So if people are interested in that, um, they should be able to. Um, find it there. Um, it sounds like a terrific resource for people who are interested in thinking about um, both uh, the, the current uh, possibilities for activism and, and future activism. So um, hopefully we can have people um, track that down and, and take advantage of it. It sounds like a wonderful resource. Um, and with that, let's uh, let's turn to um, last but certainly not least, um, Frankie. I think is going to also have a lot to say, a lot to reflect on um, on these questions on on threats and opportunities for for democracy during this time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth and Mesna and Jamila. I I have to start back a little bit, a few decades. <laughs> I. Um, if you don't know anything about my the way my brain works, I a long time ago when I wrote Diet for a Small Planet 50 years ago next year, um, it was because I realized that we human beings create the world according to ideas that we hold. <laughs> and um, another way of saying it, I just heard recently that those who tell the story rule the world. And that was uh, attributed to Plato and to the Hopi Indians. So I think it's got to be true. And so I try to look at what is the dominant story? What is the story that got us to this place? And my sense that the story that is so destructive that has, has I'm speaking as, you know, from, from the United States, uh, but the story that has so gripped us and so failed us is now, I think, being challenged in this moment of great threat and opportunity. So that really quickly, I, I will try to summarize it as way back, you know, in the, in the early 80s, late 70s, uh, in the 70s and, and 80s, the, the dominant, dominant story that we absorbed was that government is the enemy. And um, Reagan's famous line in his inaugural address was, um, the government is not the solution to our problem, it is the problem. And I think that idea that, that freedom is freedom from one another and from the government has been so much the thread that has, has kept us from realizing 
the potential of our society. That then combined with this notion that America is the best democracy, when in fact the international observers at the Electoral Integrity Project place us 56th in the world. <laughs> and yet we have this idea that we're the best. And you know, I think we sort of think that maybe we have greater economic inequality than Western Europe. Yes, but we also have greater economic inequality than 100 countries in the world, more than. So um, this story that uh, government is the enemy, we don't have a tool, therefore, to uh, realize values that benefit us all because no, 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 we can't, government regulation, government rules, that's oppressive. And so we learn this idea of liberty as liberty from one another rather than what I've experienced in my life that it is through community, through connection that we are able to really uh, know the opportunity and fulfillment that is, is freedom. So I think we are in this moment where with the COVID epidemic uh, exposing in this society so much of the extreme inequality, we now know that inequality racist in its roots in many ways is showing up in this great disproportion of people of color suffering from the pandemic. I have an African-American friend who at one point, his family, there were three people in the hospital in one small family and two others that were threatened with the disease. And it just brought it so home to me and all the statistics tell us. So that's exposed. And we also, because of the pandemic, we are seeing and appreciating um, the vast numbers of people who do the work in this society that are often invisible from farm workers, um, half of whom are undocumented and have no protections. And of course, health workers are now being seen and honored. And I think that's shifting our perception of our connectedness and dependence and uh, our need for leadership, which this anti-government framing of the story led us directly, I believe, to the election of Donald Trump. Because as people were feeling so distressed and so angry at the losses that that frame took us to, that they really just wanted to, you know, the, the, the metaphor of just throwing the brick, you know, just even my own brother, you know, voted for Donald Trump and grew up in a very liberal household. So I think that uh, there's a lot of opportunity here to tell a different story, to realize and feel a different story. And part of that is what I just said is, is that appreciating now how much we depend on others. Uh, certainly, you know, down to who wears a mask and who doesn't, we're protecting not just ourselves, but others. And all those, all the workers who are out there risking uh, for, for us. So I think that is opening a tremendous opportunity and at the same time, you know, my own life's work, I, I started the question why hunger in the world and began to say hunger is caused not by a scarcity of, of food, certainly not. There's more than enough and there still is, but a scarcity of democracy. And so I've tried more and more to ask at any moment, what can I do? How can my voice, how can my institute, how can in any way that I help further the rising of accountable to the people democracy in America. Um, how can I both crack this, this image of ourselves as the best when we're not at all, at the same time offering people uh, excitement of, as was said in my introduction, democracy as how we live, democracy as a way of life. And so I'm excited that uh, three, um, Four years ago, four years ago, I, I had this great awakening when I marched from Washington to Washington, D.C., excuse me, from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. with the democracy spring. And it was the first, I think, national major outpouring of, in that kind of visible way, addressing not just a single issue, but the democracy itself. And we had a large sit-in, perhaps one of the largest in history, on the Capitol steps, 1,400 of us were arrested for democracy reforms. And so that awakened me to the real life-changing experience that, oh, I get it. There is a democracy movement, and I'm really part of it. And um, 
and it's still invisible to most Americans, but we're doing everything we can to make it visible. And if this conversation were happening just a few weeks from now, I could send you the URL to a new website. If you wanted to make a note of it, it's democracymovement.us. And on this website, um, you'll see many things that are exciting, but one is a map of the United States and you can go to your state and see exactly what democracy reforms that you can help further in your state, whether it is fighting voter suppression or gerrymandering the jigger, you know, the um, district lines that disempower, uh, whether it is, um, um, you know, uh, just basic mail-in mail voting, which we're going to need now. There's so many reforms that we can be part of. And so that's really what gets me up in the morning is realizing uh, that yes, this is a very, very painful time of tremendous loss. And at the same time, it is this feeling that the, the, the old obstacles, the mental obstacles, this sense of, uh, uh, government is the other and that liberty is resistance from others to feeling our true connection, opening up possibilities to what I call living democracy at the same time that this democracy movement is, is truly growing. And if you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend a film that just came out about a month ago, I believe, called Slay the Dragon. And it is a cinematic, beautifully cinematic movie, uh, documentary, uh, but not a not a you should kind of boring documentary, but a real exciting uh, visuals of what people are actually doing with local heroes that you will meet and be so inspired by. Um, this is called again Slay the Dragon. So I feel that yes, I, I echo my my wonderful partners here on the themes of hope and fear, and and I um, wrote a little book with a millennial uh, many years ago called. Um, you have the power. Actually, our title was, um, the publisher came up with that title. Our title was uh, Fear Means Go. <laughs> and the idea of taking, we were both experiencing a lot of fear, my co-author and I, Jeffrey Perkins, and we realized that fear can be a source of energy. It, it is just pure energy that we can use as we choose. And I think that, but of course we need others with us. And that's the great thing about this conversation and the democracy movement that there are so many who are doing what they thought we, they could not do. And that's how I end my last book, again with a millennial uh, called Daring Democracy, Adam Eichen and I wrote about the democracy movement. And we end with that theme that, that goodness is not good enough right now, that we've got to uh, learn a new kind of courage of doing what we thought we could not do. And um, that is the thrill of democracy. So that's really the, some of the themes that I'm living with right now. And I just want to end, I had another thought about the, the climate crisis because I'm writing a very short book about our response to the climate crisis that I really think that, that potentially that this terrible pandemic um, can awaken our, I think of, you know, I'm, child of this culture, so I am very limited to that, but that we have such a hard time imagining future, future threats. And now we see what happens when we weren't imaginative, didn't listen to the people who, who said that pandemics were inevitable. <laughs> and so I'm thinking that on some level that uh, we will be able then to come out of this realizing that we have to now begin. There's so many positive things that people don't know in their communities that they can do to help uh, help um, deal with the pending uh, and existing climate catastrophe. So uh, those are just some of the thoughts I'd like to share and uh, they are what keep me going. So thank you for this opportunity. Terrific, thank you so much. Um, and I might just take this moment to remind people if they'd like to send questions for the panelists or uh, offer their own reflections, it's uh, rlc-webinar at ucsc.edu. And now I'm hoping to have a few moments of, of conversation amongst the panelists before we open it up to a, a Q&A and, and give um, Jamila and Veshna and Frankie 
a chance to respond to each other's ideas or um, any of the, the thoughts that they had put out there. Obviously, there's been a, a huge range of, of thoughts, both about the set of problems that we're having um, in the US um, here, where some of us are, but also in Europe and, and beyond Europe um, in other countries. And, um, and so that's one kind of set of strands or the, what we're seeing in terms of the, the responses around the world. And then, um, and then also these questions about what the, um, the moments of hope and solidarity and opportunity either for activists or democracy movements more particularly, lots of different ideas out there. So um, do you, any of you want to kind of reflect on or share any further on anything that you've heard um, your fellow panelists um, speaking to um, in the last um, few moments? I would just maybe have additional question, uh, both for Jamila and Frankie, as uh, with this uh, time, uh, we experienced so new uh, online conversations, but one limitation which seems to be there is that when we really try to brainstorm, you know, there are all these wonderful examples out there and Jamila, I'm really thankful for, for the link and for, all these years of work which uh, Gene Sharp and his team have invested in really documenting all nonviolence uh, actions because it's so so precious to all of us. But uh, I really experienced uh, with all these reunions online with colleagues and new people that when we speak online, somehow we cannot really be as creative as in uh, our conversations when we are sitting in one room or um, as a matter of fact, under the tree in the park. So it's that, um, do you have some responses, you know, how to, how to get around that? Because it looks like we might still have quite some time in front of us when we'll be linked online with all these borders closed, uh, how to be more creative in this online space. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, J Jamila or Frankie, do either of you have some thoughts on that? It does seem um, for many of us in academia, we're kind of living our whole lives, doing our yeah. classes, everything's online. And, and we do feel that as amazing as it can be with the technology, it also feels very limiting not to have, I mean, I think all of us value right now so much more real human contact that we you know so often take for granted and I, I think Beshna's question about sort of what do we do when when we may for some foreseeable time not be able to have as much of that that very invigorating real human contact what what can get the creativity going in, in a way when we're kind of in these <laughs> on, on living on our screen so much of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a great question. It's one I've been really grappling with, you know, even sort of pre-pandemic. I think it's, it's, it's a question that's been raised by sort of uh, students of movements and, and, and scholars. Um, uh, there's a scholar, uh, Zainab Tufekci, who's written about really how uh, the tech tools were really a source of, you know, great euphoria that, you know, somehow this would lead to democratic, uh, more democracy in the world. But in fact, what they've done in, in terms of reducing the cost of organizing and mobilizing it sounds like a good thing right but it's actually kind of sidestepped all the all the really necessary building work because it allows you to have large-scale mobilization without sort of structures behind them and institutions that can you know really be uh, important in articulating vision and also in really sustaining movement and and in dealing with repression and also you know uh, 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 working working for transition so I've been worried in this moment as we're seeing an even more increase in the sort of online stuff how can we make this this engagement really uh, you know uh, deeper um, because I think that's been that's been a real problem you know and I think we're seeing in, in 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 the years before this pandemic that you know we had an increased level of engagement in the world uh, but it didn't always translate into real effective fundamental change uh, because we focused heavily on mobilizing I'm wondering right and this is really more of a question I'm really interested in what what you all think um, is really is there a way in which this moment forces us to take you know to to, 
to focus less on the mobilizing, to focus more on the building and in using technology, not to bring people to the streets, but to actually learn and to create systems for decision making and, and future action uh, and ways that can make the online stuff sort of, again, just, just, just deeper and more sustainable and really more impactful and powerful. Uh, so no answers, just, just a lot of questions like, like, like we all have. I, I have a thought. I don't know. Um, you're the you're the, much more in touch than I. But I've noticed the difference between group, a big difference between group discussions online, and the, the few, you know, one on ones that are so utterly different when you're really with a buddy. And I wonder if we could be more aware of a buddy system in our larger movements. That um, that yes. We all gather, but there's the, even if they're just assigned, you know, you get an assigned buddy. But I really think this buddy system that one person, it's one of the things we want to do on our website, this democracymovement.org, is to have people kind of volunteer to be a buddy of somebody coming into the movement for, for the first time. I'm still trying to figure out what to call it, <laughs> but um, you know, that they could connect to and ask questions and one on one. So. That's the only thought that that I'd like to share. This in, um, really making possible and making people feel less awkward about pairing up. That's great. Are there other um, questions that you have for each other? Or other things that kind of stood out to any of you about the the themes and, and conversations and, and responses that each of you has been having to this? I have a, a, a question or sort of, let's see, am I on mute? No, I'm not. Um, just a sort of uh, something that I've been, I've been grappling with and thinking about. Um, and, it, and, and, and I think, uh, uh, Vesna, you, you might have referred to it earlier in terms of, you know, is this a moment of uh, where it's important to maintain solidarity and to really focus on building and to focus on sort of, you know, how do we survive this moment? Or is this an opportunity to take what's you know, some of us are doing and what some movements are doing in a sort of anti-government framing of it and, and bringing attention to what some of the failures that we're seeing also by the responses we've seen globally. Uh, and, and is there a danger in that or, or is it so context specific? Uh, because I think that, you know, there's been, I've, I've heard, you know, among some of the people that, that I've, I've, been, I've been talking to and observing uh, that they, they feel a sense of, you know, that there's a sort of pressure to, to, to not criticize the government or its response because uh, somehow that's seen as unhelpful or really undermining what should be a moment of solidarity, uh, you know, even, even in, in, in terms of uh, like how we view the government. Um, maybe, maybe one or both of you have any thoughts to share on that? Well, in our context, uh, in Croatia, there is surely also social pressure not to criticize government now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's that I shared with colleagues uh, in other post yugoslav countries, it's simply this impression uh, government is organizing a response with experts uh, in the best possible way. So criticism would be like an obstacle. I also notice, uh, for example, BBC, uh, or the economists reflecting on themselves and uh, their way of reporting in the moment, also underlining that this is not a moment for really profound criticism. They would surely frame it slightly different, but actually it's that they're aware that they want to be there for people to motivate and inspire them, meaning that they might mention somewhere as mistakes are down uh, that uh, government uh, did this or that wrong, but not, you know, not returning to it, not delivering analyses on three pages, uh, outlining all the, all the many mistakes which have been done. So it's finding a balance. But uh, to me, this social pressure is much more interesting that the space for any kind of critical reflection in a time of, you know, I recall very clearly in time of war, 
and uh, for example, for President Macron of France, there was a time in this crisis when he eventually uh, described it as a war, although he gave up on it later, uh, because it was impossible to held it in this kind of uh, terminology. So it's that uh, the, the important question for us as uh, you know, civil actors, activists, uh, citizens organize this or that, is how far are we ready to accept that the space for criticism is so narrowed now? Will we simply shut, uh, shut down and you know, do some actions, but uh, not expect much of how visible will there be? Uh, and how long this period of narrow space for criticism will last? Uh, and will there be again, uh, you know, the same space for criticism available because it's always that this space for criticism is shrinking and expanding. And it's really up to the action of journalists and civil actors to either expand it with your actions uh, or leave it simply, uh, you know, a narrow as it is, and always looking around for cracks in this monolith of attempted control, because what, you know, governments uh, are easily uh, sleeping in is over-controlling and uh, extending uh, the limits of uh, what they are supposed to control uh, and what they uh, have got through legislation. So it's, it's, it's a very slippery slope in a way. So it's that I'm always very wary of these times when space for criticism gets so narrowed down as is the question just now. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, I think that, that that question of whether things will return to some former version of normal or whether uh, what's been happening in so many countries is creating a different kind of normal is, is one that we're, we're not sure, you know, what, what the, the next um, uh, kind of forward path is, is going to be um, with respect to the, the ways in which people can respond or demand certain kinds of responses um, from, from their, their leaders. And um, I might just ask uh, Jamila to follow up a little bit, thinking about uh, the kinds of things um, that people are building now. You gave that great example of people in, in Hong Kong and kind of the different forms of uh, that movements are taking now. Um, and so maybe just kind of following up on that idea of what what we're already seeing that maybe could either be models, uh, models of hope, um, kind of examples of, of what's possible, um, or as Veshna said, kind of where people are finding the spaces and the cracks um, to be doing either some of the critical work or some of the solidarity work that seems so valuable right now. Are, are there other kinds of examples that we want to, to draw out or, or give um, from any of you? Well, I've been uh, collecting some of these examples. I've been basically, you know, dumping them in a, in a, in a spreadsheet for, you know, analysis later. Um, and it's just, you know, uh, uh, really incredible. Um, so I'm trying to think about how to sort of catalog them, but we're seeing, you know, sort of the digital adaptations of the sort of existing offline methods. We're seeing, you know, how gatherings, obviously, you know, just, just the way we're adapting in other areas of our life, how movements are adapting also using, you know, using Zoom, for example. Um, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of online Online webinars. I've been uh, on plenty of them, uh, like this one, for example, you know, um, uh, and, and a lot of skills building workshops that I've seen. We've seen, you know, we've seen what we've talked about also the sort of trade unions and citizens that are distributing food. Um, there's been an increase in electronic petitions, including suspension of rent. We've seen um, ways in which people have used the streets, but also kind of observed the physical distancing 
guidelines and restrictions, right? Like car marches. We saw in Israel how uh, protesters um, uh, conducted a protest, but you know had X's in the street where they were, you know, had to stand six feet apart. It's really quite a quite a spectacular scene. Um, Chilean activists projected images of crowds in empty streets. Um, we've seen a lot of strikes, uh, especially among healthcare workers, uh, including in Hong Kong. Um, and in fact, one of the main unions that was built during this past year has been really instrumental in, in, in striking. Um, so there is, uh, as we mentioned, the car, car caravans. We've seen uh, the banging of the pots and pans uh, inside people's homes. We've seen a lot of art. Uh, you know, we've seen the flourishing of music and singing and, and instruments. We saw that, you know, we've seen some really cool videos coming out of different parts of the world of people, you know, kind of making music on their balconies. Um, so, yeah, I think that there's a lot that people are doing to sort of collect these methods. I think humans are doing what they do best, which is, you know, taking a moment to regroup, but then quickly kind of reemerging and figuring out how they can negotiate these new restrictions in ways that can help them, you know, at least maintain a sense of hope that all, you know, it, it is not lost and, and also just, just maintain that momentum so that again, when we, when we emerge from this, that there is, that that our movements have survived it. Um, so yeah, as I said, I think the 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 some of the methods that that I've been seeing that are very much behind the scenes are the sort of gatherings that are taking place where movements are sitting down and figuring out what the next steps are. And in some of these, I've heard the sentiment expressed that opponents of freedom are doing exactly that, figuring out how they can take advantage of this moment and that it would be a mistake if, if, if we didn't, didn't, do, this, didn't do the same. Um, so I'm, I'm finding that really encouraging, this idea that we need to build strength and capacity um, and that that's really going to determine what kind of a future that we have and, and how we survive and, and, and also take, take, uh, take advantage or, or uh, you know, understand our responsibility in this moment. That's great. Frankie, did you have any kind of other reflections? It sounds like you're in the midst of creating it's I, I, it's we need a whole like page of the spreadsheet just for the movements that you've helped to inspire and coordinate. Um, I don't know if you want to say any more about um, you said the website and the, the idea of having these kinds of democracy reform networks and um, and and networking opportunities that uh, people can get connected with. Is there, there more on that or how you see that uh, tying together with anything that's already underway or, or other kinds of opportunities? Well, thank you. I love what's been said by the other speakers and so, so appreciate all these insights. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess you could say the theme song of my life is this living democracy that I, I love to say that, you know, we grow up in this country thinking, oh, you know, democracy, that's that blah spinach we have to force down to get our dessert of personal freedom and i i want to just totally turn that around and and say that you know being human means uh being not just having our physical needs met but our need for a voice power and a sense of meaning in our lives and connection with others and that's what democracy is all about so that's what we're trying to to really awaken Americans too, that most of us have no idea that say in the 2018 midterm elections that there were um, almost 20 in state and local level, almost 20 significant reforms passed. And most people had no idea uh, because so much is happening. You know, we think of Washington and this disaster of the current administration that is violating, violating so many democracy norms and rules and and traditions, but at the state and local level, so much is happening. So we want to shine the light on that and you know, encourage people again to this personal connection so that democracy is a matter of the heart, not just a you should, but a we can. <laughs> and that's the, the idea here. And um, so, um, yeah, I, I would love anyone who's listening to this, uh, uh, our web, our um, email address to get give us feedback. If you would like to see that website, we're going to do a soft launch. It's just info at smallplanet.org, info at 
info at smallplanet.org. And you could give us feedback on how to make this website more useful to you and to make it truly interactive. But um, it's really, yeah, just to make visible what is already underway, because as I listen to you and, and hear, you know, what's going on, I get my, my heart starts um, beating faster that, oh, yeah, you know, there's much more than I think. So that's the spirit of this. And then we're, we'll have videos of people describing their own experiences as well. So it, you can, you can um, see what's going on that way, literally, not just uh, in the written word. And so um, that's the core idea. And um, it, we're working directly with an organization called Democracy Initiative. And this, I think, is an historic moment that starting, this was about five years ago, I believe, um, seven years ago, um, something like that, uh, a number of issue organizations, environment like Sierra Club, for example, and labor, communication workers, and uh, race, you know, uh, NAACP and others came together to create a movement of movements for democracy. And they call it the Democracy Initiative. And there are now 72 organizations, US organizations, that represent about 45 million Americans who have who have said, okay, I'm not going to give up my environmental or my race issue, or you know, I'm not going to give up my my issue, but I'm going to spend part of my organizational uh, strength for democracy itself. And that I don't think has ever happened before. So that's one of the themes of this website and our all of my work is that there is now this movement of movements that is new and. A friend of mine said to me when I was explaining, you know, wait, I come out of the food movement. How can I be in democracy movement? He said, Frankie, you know, you can love two children at once. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got two. So I, I managed to do that. So I, I, that idea that we can identify with a particular issue that we care most about, whether it be climate change or racial justice, but that we can also recognize that the root is uh, actually uh, creating a democracy in this in our countries and um, so that's I hope that answered your question but that's sort of more of the landscape that I live in these days yeah yes that's terrific and and gets us back on that that kind of note of of hope and optimism that um, has been important to the conversation I think I want to go ahead we do have a couple of, of questions that people have been sending in and I I mean it might just pause here um, and and um, put those on the table and see which of you would like to um, to respond to those so these are the questions that are coming in at rlc webinar at ucsc.edu and I just need to scroll down my page to sort of see some that um, that we might want to bring into the conversation. So um, we have a question here from Stephen. Um, he says, there have been some significant findings by journalists and international groups. For example, the findings of the Panama Papers and Afghan Papers that are damning of the international capitalist system and USA imperialism respectively. How have these and other related findings revealed threats to democratic states and democracy in general. Um, these weren't the, the points that any of you were speaking to particularly. I don't know if you wanna to speak to that specific question or maybe the, the I'll call it the more general question of uh, capitalism, colonialism um, and, and what roles that we may be seeing those playing uh, kind of currently. Um. Is it, I don't want to jump in if somebody else wanted to, but I, I, for me, the mentioning of the Panama Papers, <laughs> it's funny, we, in, in, in trying to escape, we, we went to a movie with Mel, Meryl Streep in it that looked like a kind of distracting movie and it ended on the Panama Papers. <laughs> it's called Laundromat, about laundering money. It was very funny. Uh, not very funny, but um, anyway, um, I think that uh, one of the key questions has to do with what are the resources available for the public good. And we now see in our country that said, oh no, we can't use government money to do anything. Suddenly they're thrilling, they're, you know, there are trillions of dollars now being invested in trying to meet this pandemic. And so that brings up the question going forward with the climate crisis, with extreme inequality, with hunger amidst plenty in this country, 
what are the resources that we have to have to use? And uh, I think the more that we can educate, again, I apologize for being in just the, the American context, but we are so extreme in the way that we, our tax system is so unfair and misses, we, you know, under the Trump administration, they've actually pulled back the internal revenue service personnel so that we have even less capacity to get the, the public funds that we need from the people who can afford to pay for them. And we have something like, uh, of 60 of our biggest corporations pay zero in taxes and tax havens um, like, you know, when you exposed in the Panama Papers uh, are evading just billions and billions of dollars. And so I hope that as we move forward, as we recognize that yes, the public uh, sector, the, the, our government is, has to step up to address these deeper problems of recovery from the pandemic that, that, we, that we encourage uh, this deeper look at what are the untapped resources uh, that our, our terribly unfair tax system um, imposed, you know, the, the, missing, the missing resources that we have. And so I think that's a huge problem for democracy that hopefully will be more in the public eye. Ashna, go ahead. I just uh, uh, wanted to... Uh... Uh, add a comment that uh, local level, despite all controls, despite Panama Papers, uh, legacy of colonialism, capitalism is so important. So as uh, Frankie was mentioning film, I uh, remembered uh, film uh, Honeyland uh, about uh, one of the last bee hunters in Europe who is eventually taking care about bees in Macedonia and bringing a balance to nature uh, in Macedonia. In her well, village is even overstatement because she is the last inhabitant of that village. So is that a still village or is not village? Uh, it's uh, amazing what one person can do, what two can do, what three, four, five can do as uh, documented in Jamila and Jean Sharp work. It's amazing. So is that, uh, when I think about days after uh, the immediate crisis now, uh, maybe in one month or two, uh, it's amazing what uh, people in one small town or bigger town locally can do uh, to support each other and to analyze where we succeeded, where we failed, what can we do and how we'll move on. It is that, uh, you know, just exploring all these critical questions in a school, uh, at our works, at our activist groups. Uh, there is so much we can do together and keep doing. So is that uh, disregarding all controls which are there, disregarding uh, the moments when we get uh, dispirited by uh, you know, the global uh, movements which look like uh, the machinery of capitalism or uh, with all the steps our governments uh, do or don't do, uh, there is so much uh, we can do and keep doing. So it's that uh, I personally find uh, uh, Honeyland a wonderful uh, documentary and uh, we really should uh, look at what we can do uh, for each other as human beings and what we can do for nature. Great. Well, I might take this opportunity to take us to a kind of closing question and have each of you give some, some responses to it. And this is the question of, of having each of you imagine um, two years from now or, or some, some um, kind of time in the not unforeseeable future, if we've been successful in, in seizing some of the opportunities or some of the important um, work that you've all been identifying um, at various points in this conversation, what do you think the most important or significant advances or, um, or, or steps forward we might be able to see in two years if people continued on, on working on some of the things that you've been identifying? Um, and maybe Jamila, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you um, to get your voice back in. Uh, 
Yeah, I think it's such an interesting time to be uh, imagining our future, but I think maybe it's a great time to be doing that. And I think that there is a sense of clarity in this moment as so many of our systems have been really made visible in the ways in which they have uh, a lot of injustice and inequality sort of built into them and how they're not meeting the needs of our communities. I think um, uh, we'd like to see in the future uh, a sense that we use use this time uh, to really bring attention to that, to try to really articulate uh, a vision uh, that really, you know, uh, 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 looks at uh, looks at the institutions and the systems in our society and figure out how they better meet the needs of people. Um, and I think there it, it needs to be in a, in a way that really kind of centers the communities that are most affected by our policies, also uh, centers centers them um, and really makes them part of this investigation and also into crafting those solutions. Um, and I think really articulates the the idea that there's there's a lot of great power in our communities, um, not some sort of intangible thing, but really concrete political power that can be used to create new institutions and new new sort of basis of power. So I would like to see a future of greater empowerment of our communities and 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 uh, strengthen civil society, uh, strengthen institutions, the the you know, the, the strengthening of existing institutions and the creation of new ones, um, and really one that centers, you know, the most uh, sort of vulnerable uh, among us, you know. And I think there's been so much said about sort of the way in which this moment has made visible all of the injustices in our society. And I think that it, perhaps, you know, people are recognizing that for, for, the, for the first time, um, that you know, all of these sort of structural problems and using that as a moment to kind of reimagine our, our systems and our futures um, in ways that can really allow us to emerge from this, uh, you know, uh, 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 with, the, with the creation of that new power um, could be very important at this moment. That's great, thank you. Um, Frankie, did you wanna give any reflections on what you might be able to imagine two years from now if we've succeeded in any of the democracy work or other work that you're imagining, what what you what we would see, what kinds of advances or reforms we would be able to say, look what we've done. Well, I, I guess I'd begin with uh, trust. That I think the trust now uh, in our institutions, certainly in Congress, that we've gone from I believe in the mid '60s there was a 77 percent trusted government to do the right thing, and now it's down to 17 percent. And so I think coming out of this crisis and certainly feeling uh, on the part of many people that um, certainly at the federal level that we've, uh, our leadership has failed, that there will be new leadership as of this November and that uh, with this growing democracy movement, people will assume that it's uh, going to improve not just by electing a different president, but by truly engaging more and more and more. And I, uh, and so I'm hoping that, you know, that all of that I see popping up, I just was thinking as you all were talking about the, the individual um, uh, initiatives that inspire you with the one in one of the Dakotas is called Badass Grandmas Organized <laughs> for Democracy. <laughs> so, you know, from, from grandmas to the Sunrise Movement, which inspires me so much, uh, the, the, the intergenerational collaboration that I've seen, um, I, I feel like that could just be released enormously in coming out of this crisis and, and then facing together the democracy slash uh, the climate crisis because they're so interconnected. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm hoping. I just am so excited about the young people Re you know, engaging in a way, but not like we did in the 60s where we were, you know, <laughs> dissing all the elders. But now that I'm one, I, I, I really am thrilled <laughs> with the intergenerational collaboration and that finally, I hope that this will spur much more this link between very direct deliberative democracy and uh, possibilities of our coming together across the country to actually discuss policy choices face to face in libraries and schools and all. And I think that potential could come out of this feeling of wanting more connection, uh, having been deprived of it. So I just so hope that 
um, that this is, can be a, a rebirth and, and deeper understanding of the very meaning and practice of democracy. That's great. Thank you. And, and Vashna, what about you? What do you, what would you hope to see or what could you imagine seeing in two years if, if people took advantage of or, or followed through on, on some of the possibilities that, that you've seen? Well, first, I do hope for more in-depth exchanges uh, locally, you know, uh, nearly on street and the most local community level. But then also uh, uh, intergenerational exchange uh, and uh, there are huge opportunities. I think we do not use enough that once we'll be again physically gathering and having uh, our exchanges in a smaller and bigger towns, that there is possibility of inviting online contribution also. You know, uh, now we have had so much experience with online format. Uh, I believe we learned how to better combine uh, physical and online. Uh, and uh, it's that I really think that for continuity of civic engagement, it's very important to seriously look to structured ways of sharing and learning from each other, especially between different generations. Uh, so it's uh, that th this is this is a challenge, and uh, we uh, we can uh, get better at it. Uh, it's also that uh, one line is uh, really activism and uh, awareness building, uh, but other is as Jamila said uh, earlier, building structures. So it's not just about mobilizing, it's about building civil structures, but it's also making our governments to be more supportive of uh, civic engagement, uh, as many governments are not supportive of it. Uh, and it's also about critical support to institutional building in sense of uh, our judicial, executive, and legislative institutions. As uh, you know, in this growing populism, uh, once more time, we have seen how important it is to support the democratic institutions uh, in time when uh, unbelievably populist candidates are promising earth and heaven, totally unrealistic, not having to do with any kind of, you know, research or factual base whatsoever. So it's, you know, sometimes I really feel completely uh, extended between uh, a very local level and working with my friends uh, on community level with the need to eventually say something about the global problems. And UN, which is perennially going through uh, reinventing and uh, reform. And we have seen, you know, we have seen again how much we need them. And on the level of principles and values, uh, I work so much with survivors of divorce humanitarian violations, with rape survivors, with genocide survivors, uh, that the principles of UN on uh, the access to uh, judicial remedies on reparation are the best we have, but it's just that they are not you know, advocated thoroughly. They are not embraced sufficiently by our governments. When government of Croatia or some other European countries is sort of standing behind any kind of message of secretary general, they even don't publish it on the web page of Ministry of Foreign Affairs. God forbid uh, transferring it in campaign. It cannot be all left to citizens. And I know really how important it is to critically support judicial institutions because the survivors always expect a lot from uh, judiciary. They always expect a lot from, you know, from the ministry responsible for searching for forcibly disappeared. Civic actions are important, but when it comes to search for forcibly disappeared, we need a functioning democratic institutions. So it is that uh, I hope that in this crisis, in this global pandemic crisis, we'll make a step forward in sense of uh, accessibility of uh, healthcare, in sense of uh, seriousness of uh, getting closer to justice and getting closer to you know, recognition of important work of civic initiatives 
and uh, closer to kind of global solidarity. That's a terrific note to end on. And, and I'll just um, add here um, that I'm teaching a class now on law and inequality. And so much of what we've been talking about is, is are these ideas that you've all been bringing up and then Veshna really brought together so well in these comments that there's such a gap between our principles and our practices and that we need kind of a, a multi-dimensional approach in which our civic activism is pushing towards the goals and the ideals that we want to see come forward, but then uh, that our institutions are also being held to account in doing their part that um, closing the justice gap, so to speak, and other things is not possible without fun functioning institutions. We really need both civil society and movements and activists doing their part, but then institutions too, and really the, the, um, the dialogue and the, the interaction between them um, needs, to, needs to be in place before we're going to see the, 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 the many possibilities, the, the excellent possibilities that you've all raised um, perhaps move forward in the next few years. So with that, I will thank you all. This has been such a rich conversation. I've, I've really enjoyed and learned so much from all of you. I'm sure all of our, our um, audience has as well. Um, I'll just let everyone know that the next webinar for the Right Livelihood Conversations will be May 27th, and that will be on inequality and vulnerability in crisis. And today's video is going to be posted on the Right Livelihood YouTube channel later this week. So thank you again, everyone. Thank this you. was really exciting for, for me and, and a wonderful um, a wonderful way to learn from all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all. I learned so much. Mm -hmm.